All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, so I want to first welcome our attendees and then our panelists to the Santa Barbara County Food Action Network County Food and Farming Discussion Series. Lena and Carla are our interpreters today and they go over how to access Spanish interpretation. Hello, this is a bilingual message that will be repeated in English. Hola, este es un mensaje bilingüe que será repetido en inglés. Mi nombre es Carla Martens y estoy aquí con mi compañera Elena Morán. Estamos aquí por parte de Uniendo Voces y vamos a, a dar interpretación simultánea durante esta sesión. Un ambiente bilingüe virtual exitoso depende de todos y todas, no solo de los intérpretes. Pueden ayudar teniendo en cuenta algunos puntos. Hablen claramente para asegurar que los podamos escuchar. Hablen a un ritmo moderado, especialmente si están leyendo. Debe hablar solo una persona a la vez y hablen en el idioma en el que se sientan más cómodos y cómodas. Pedimos a las personas bilingües que por favor no cambien de un idioma a otro, especialmente dentro de la misma frase. Si en un momento el anfitrión activará la función de interpretación y en la esquina inferior derecha de su pantalla verán un globo. Ahí podrán seleccionar interpretación y podrán seleccionar el idioma en el que desean escuchar esta sesión. Si tienen cualquier problema con la función de interpretación, por favor contacten al anfitrión por la ventana del chat. Muchas gracias. Hi, my name is Carla Martins and I'm here with my partner, Lena Moran. We'll be providing simultaneous interpretation during today's event. A, a successful virtual bilingual environment depends on all of us, not just the interpreters. You can help by keeping a few things in mind. Please speak clearly to ensure that we can hear you. Please speak at a moderate pace, especially if you're reading, so that we make sure we catch everything you say. Uh, only one person should speak at a time, and we want to let you know to please speak in the language you feel most comfortable in, English or Spanish. We do ask bilingual folks to not switch from one language to another, especially mid-sentence. In a moment, the host will activate the um, interpretation function, which is located at the bottom right hand of the screen. You'll see a globe where you'll be able to select uh, English or Spanish, whichever language you wish to hear this uh, session in. If you're having any issue with the interpretation function, please contact the host through the chat box. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carla and Lana again. So this uh, from here, sorry. Uh, so the webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a link to the recording and other resources after the event. All resources will be made available on our website, which is posted in the chat. We will also be sent through email to everyone that attended. This is an active session and your engagement is welcome. We invite you to ask questions in the Q&A during presentations and the panel will answer them as we are able to do during the presentation and in the Q&A time at the end. You may upvote or comment on questions that other people have posted. Please use the chat for any other comments you may have or resources you wanna share. We will be sending a follow-up email with relevant sources, resources for all participants. We have a support team here to help us, including Iris, who you'll see as one of the panelists, Alan and Kayla. All right, let's get started. So first, before we do anything else, I want to acknowledge that we are standing on Chumash land, unceded indigenous territories. We continue to remind ourselves of this day after day as we do this food system work to provide some background on the Food Action Network. The purpose of the Santa Barbara County Food Action Network is to connect, align, and activate a network of food system actors to develop a robust local food network, excuse me, economy, a healthy and just community, and a well-stewarded, resilient food shed in Santa Barbara County. We are a new network uh, launched at fall of 2019 and we were brought together to scale up and diversify the implementation of the Santa Barbara County Food Action Plan. The plan, which was published in 2016, details 16 specific goals aimed at improving the resilience and sustainability of our local food system. 
We just closed a round of grant making, as many of you may know, and you'll be hearing about the funded projects and other ways to get engaged in the network in the next month. We also just launched a stay home and eat local for the holidays campaign to support safe and local food purchasing for your holiday meals. We're really excited about it. And there's a link in the chat. So please check it out to learn more about ways to support local farmers this holiday season. So the focus of this discussion is on our local food system and our local farms. Our county has a robust local food economy. Agriculture is the number one contributor to our county's economy, providing over 25,000 jobs in 2018 and yielding a production value of close to one and a half billion dollars. The production value places our county in the top 1% of all counties in the United States. Let me repeat that. The production value places our county in the top 1% of all counties in the United States. Our farmers grow commercial quantities of more than 50 vegetables, everything from artichokes to zucchini. Yet a vast majority of this food is exported. As is true for many agricultural communities, there are quite a few barriers to entry to local markets for our producers. So we're excited to dig into how we currently and how we can better support local food production and cultivate localized food marketing and distribution. Our stellar panel will walk us through their experiences selling and buying local, how we can embrace our amazing central coast climate resources and what opportunities are out there to advance a more regenerative and regional food economy. So, I'm pleased to welcome all of you and all of our panelists again. We'll have the panelists introduce themselves, then we'll dive into discussion and then make some time for Q&A at the end. Here we go. So I'd like to start, I'm looking at my screen here uh, with uh, Jenya Schneider and Jack Anderson of Kuyama Lamb. Take it away guys. Hey everybody, I'm Jenya. I'm Jack. And together we are Kuyama Lamb, well us and our 500 sheep. Um, we believe that land stewardship and feeding our communities should be one interwoven act. And we use grazing as a tool to restore and protect native rangelands. I just realized I'm speaking quickly, I'm gonna slow down. Uh, to protect native rangelands, to manage for wildfires and combat climate change, as well as to connect people with the lands that we inhabit. We are particularly excited about cooperative models of ownership in agriculture because we believe in the power of creativity uh, in our collectives. Um, and we are excited to represent our broader rangeland stewardship um, inside of this conversation about food access. Thanks guys. Next, I'd like to introduce Steve and Robbie Gleisman of Condors Hope and Growing the Table Initiative. Hi, I'm Robbie. And I'm Steve. And we're, we're part of Condors Hope Vineyard and we're located in the Northeast corner of Santa Barbara County in the Cuyama Valley. Um, and we are five, five acre family vineyard and olive orchard. It um, uses nature to guide us in all of our practices. We dry farm to both conserve water and to produce high quality products. And we work a lot with our local community and bringing community together to be part of our farm. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. So next we have Julian Martinez and Preston Knox of Barbarenium Restaurant. Take it away, guys. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Julian Martinez and this is Preston Knox and uh, we are the chefs at Barbarenio. Uh, Barbarenio has been open about six years now uh, in downtown Santa Barbara and uh, 
the purpose of our restaurant or our mission is to highlight and celebrate the history, culture, traditions of our local area um, through food. Um, so that includes sourcing locally, but also telling the stories about how we got here um, in a culinary way and um, yeah, kind of celebrating all that is the Santa Barbara County uh, culinary scene. Thank you both. Next, we have Clara Cadwell of 2D Pretty Farms. Hi, uh, my name is Clara Cadwell. I'm from 2D Pretty Farms, which is my family's farm. Um, we have grown organic produce since the 80s, so since I was born. Um, we've been doing certified organic produce, um, primarily because we always take care of our land, and our climate, and our ecosystems, and our community. And that's basically always been our goal. And feeding our community really, really good fresh food. I love it. Thank you. Next, we have Oscar Carmona of Healing Grounds Nursery. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Oscar Carmona, and I've uh, had the pleasure of living in this area for the last 40 years and uh, the vast majority of my life and um, have been very committed to uh, sharing with people. And uh, my work specifically uh, revolves around food, growing food in garden settings and community garden settings for people of all uh, walks of life. And of course, um, if we look at the food chain, the, the most direct way is uh, con the consumer is the producer. And we need all of this. We need these fine people here today. And we need our own uh, abilities to uh, feel empowered enough to take back our, our right and our um, abilities to grow food. Uh, and as a community to uh, do what we need to do to safeguard our ability to feed ourselves because we live in an incredibly um, uh, blessed place, uh, Chumash and otherwise. You know, there's, we have uh, year round growing opportunities that is enjoyed by very few people in the entire world. Uh, to not take advantage of this is a real uh, travesty. So hopefully uh, action can spring out of this. And I'll just close in saying that I need to leave very soon after the discussion and won't stay for the, for the Q and A. So please, um, uh, or be able to connect with me through this uh, wonderful group or uh, directly and you'll get that information later. Thank you, Oscar. I also mentioned that uh, to remind all of our uh, viewers today that you can, of course, uh, post your questions in the Q&A. Um, and we will make sure that if you have questions for Oscar, for example, that he gets them and he'll be able to follow up with you and we'll provide that information in the resources email at, um, after this webinar. All right, let's get started. But before we jump into the discussion, we first wanted to poll the audience and ask, what percentage of fruits and vegetables produced in our county do you think stay and are consumed in our county? Take a moment to complete the survey. All right, I'm thinking, yep, there it is, right on time, those poll results. So what percentage of fruits and vegetables produced in our county stay and are consumed in our county? Interesting, 39% said 5%, hmm, following with 3%. That's interesting. Well, we've got a smart, uh, accurate group around here because the answer is 5%. And that is according to Professor of Sustainable Agriculture at UCSB, David Cleveland. You'll, if you, any of you are already and continuing to follow the Santa Barbara County Food Action Network materials, you'll notice that we mentioned uh, David Cleveland a lot. So now we're going to be diving into these discussion questions that we've all been really excited about. I'm going to start with Steve, if you don't mind. Steve, your work in Kuyama gives you a bird's eye view of our food system. Let's talk about its resilience. 
what makes our food system resilient and what makes it vulnerable? Thank you, Shakira. I'm happy to answer this question a little bit. Just to get us started today, thinking about this contrast between resiliency on one hand and vulnerability on the other in a food system. And they really are key aspects of sustainability. There's a lot to resilience. There's ecological resilience, how, how balanced nature is that we're farming in. There's economic resilience in terms of livelihoods and incomes and costs of food. And finally, there's, there's social resilience where everybody in the community has access to safe, healthy, and a culturally appropriate food. So keeping our mind around those different elements, when, when a system is vulnerable, any of those three elements is at risk because of the way we farm, because of the lack of access or cost of food, and because of the exploitation in many ways of the two most important parts of the system, the people who grow the food and the people who consume the food, how, how we need to really bring those two together so that uh, we create uh, a more resilient system that's able to meet its local needs. And Robbie, you want to add how what we're doing in Kuyama connects a little to that? I think, it, you know, we, well, probably a highlight is just all that we've been through over the past but almost nine months um, with sheltering in um, as we are in this pandemic. And, and um, the resilience in, I think, probably all around the county has come through our local food system. Um, our vulnerability is our, is our um, you know, maybe what we would say our normal, what people depend on is the, as, um, the uh, food system with a really long, food chain. So the, the shorter we get that food chain, the more local we can be, the more resilience we'll have. And in Kuyama, which is really, um, it's, it's an interesting example because it's really a food desert. People in Kuyama have to drive an hour either in either east or west to reach a grocery store. So, um, but during the pandemic, we, the nonprofits that are located in, um, in Kuyama really stepped up with everything from promoting um, backyard gardens to, to, um, to providing, to making sure that there was access to food from food banks and preparing meals for vulnerable people. Um, local farmers stepped up in terms of uh, making food accessible and the local restaurant um, gave access, basically set up a mini grocery store by giving access to their food supply through, um, for people to come in and purchase. So, so it, was, it was through the coming together of the local community and who, who best knows the needs of the community to, to, that resulted in really um, making a resilient food system during this crisis. Thank you, Steve and Robbie. And I do want to add um, to what Robbie mentioned that um, in response to COVID, the Kuyama Valley's community action collectively uh, to address that issue was so inspiring. Um, what Robbie is describing, um, I had the humble privilege of witnessing uh, back in mid-September when I saw the mini market with fresh produce and fruit um, and local preserves provided by local farms such as Kuyama Homegrown and Condor's Hope. Um, it was incredible to witness. So I'm going to pivot a little bit, but staying along the same thread. Clara, your family has been growing food in this region for generations. What does Santa Barbara County offer in terms of agriculture? And in addition to that, what do we grow here and what natural systems and resources allow that to happen? Um, well, we're very, very lucky to be farming in California. Um, California provides, it feeds our nation. We can grow a lot of food in this state. Um, Santa Barbara in particular has a wonderful microclimate. Um, a lot of different climates actually, little pockets of them. 
we can grow avocados and cherimoyas and things that will only grow in Florida or tropical regions that we can grow here in the United States. Um, we can grow almost everything. I have peas growing outside of this building that I'm in right now and it's December and they're flowering and I'm not worried about it having frost on it. Uh, that's not the case. Right now I'm in Santa Barbara, one hour north of here where Tutti Frutti is, not the case. You need full frost protection. But again, um, it's December and we have heirloom tomatoes. So climate is a huge, huge factor for us. Um, lack of land and water would be another factor that's a hindrance. Um, and those two are things that are becoming more and more visible um, for the agriculture in our community. And employees. We need, we need more, more young people wanting to be farmers. Um, let's see. Uh, my family specializes in heirloom tomatoes and winter squash, chilies, but you can literally grow almost anything where we're at. Almost anything. So Clara, just to speak back to you a little bit about what you're saying, I want to make sure that I'm understanding. When you speak of land uh, needs, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Are you saying that land access in terms of ownership opportunities and affordability and access to that land is an issue? Or um, please, can you speak to that? All of the above. Uh, land pricing, as we know, in Santa Barbara County is very, very high. Um, we basically rent all of our land that we're farming on. And as organic farmers, there's a limitation on how much organic land there is. We're certified organic. That means that that land has to have been organically farmed on for years for us to be able to farm there with our certification. So honestly, all of the organic farmers in Santa Barbara County are bopping around from field to field if we are renting one area and we leave that space, one of the other organic farmers are gonna come in and fill it and vice versa um, because there's a limitation of how much of that is available. So that's uh, fascinating to me because I think that, I mean, forgive me, I'm, I'm yeah. learning here as I go. I'm shocked. I assumed that farmers will own their own land, uh, all of them, not just a vast majority. Not I think you're possibly busting a myth for us. Yeah, uh, I would say I would say it's a minority of farmers who own their land. Um, wow. Personally, I mean, maybe that's just my opinion, but I'd say that that's, and especially for up and coming farmers or younger farmers, I'd say that's a minority and almost an impossibility in this area. Um, maybe if they could group together or maybe if, they play their cards right, it can work out that way. Um, there's also a lot of competition for agricultural land. There was a big vacancy, um, ranching, cattle. Um, that was how we started farming up in the Lompoc area because there were a lot of empty spaces for us to fill. Um, wineries are a large competition. Cannabis is now a competition. I'm not saying that in a bad way. I'm just saying what the reality of it is for there's only a certain amount of agricultural land in our area. But everyone wants to grow here because of our amazing climate. Um, we live in an incredible so sounds, place. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, what sounds, what I'm hearing from you is um, the main components of our environment, such as land, water, the air we breathe, for example, they're finite. And we presume that the farmers have all of these things when in fact they're operating essentially us, not all, but many in scarcity is what I'm hearing from you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd, I'd say uh, land, water, and employees. And the employee piece. Major factor. That I put, I've definitely got a pin in that one. That the employee piece, very interesting to me. So Julian, you work on the restaurant side of things. You are in a unique position to influence local markets. What are the challenges restaurants and businesses face when trying to purchase from local farmers, fisher folk, ranchers, and distributors? Uh, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of challenges. Um, I mean, the restaurant industry in general is a, 
a very challenging industry. Uh, so the first challenge is kind of fighting through that industry. Um, the profit margin typically in restaurants, a good profit margin is between like 5% is a pretty successful restaurant, but a lot of restaurants who are seemingly doing well are at 1% profit. Um, so the one of the big challenges is just any small change you make is can eat away at that 1%. Um, so that's one thing that's just scary about changing the uh, going away from the normal protocol of ordering through restaurants. Um, another is, um, as Clara mentioned, the staff uh, restaurant industry has a very high turnover um, compared to other industries. I think it's about 1.5 times. Um, so it's about 75% turnover rate in the restaurant industry. So just the local purchasing local does require relationship building. And when you have a staff that turns over quite often, that becomes harder to establish those long-term relationships. Um, and then a third, one of the third ways is uh, tracking cost of goods sold. Um, so typically you kind of know what you're spending um, when you buy a case of cabbage through the vendor. Um, but when we go to the market, it's a little harder because we're buying from so many different sources. So it's difficult to um, track exactly where you're getting all your food. Um, and then Preston maybe can speak to a couple other uh, difficulties we face. And with that is developing the menu to be something that works with the local farms and um, deciding do we go this route and make the menu more fluid or do we have a more stable menu and order everything through vendors um, and with the seasonality of produce making sure that the dishes that go on the menu are able to change pretty quickly like within a day if something goes over or there's a frost in the fields and we can't get the, the produce. Um, so trying to develop that is definitely a challenge, um, but having all of these farmers, um, I know myself, I get a lot of ideas just by talking at the market with them um, and then they'll let me know what they have. So that definitely helps. And um, trying to manage the time of the day. There's only so many hours and I wish there was more. So it's always easier to order things through a vendor, but it's something that is important to me and to us here at Barbarino of finding that time to go to the market and to these local um, artisans and purveyors that put their hard work into it. And um, so it's just really a juggle trying to trying to balance all that and maintain our costs while doing that. What I'm hearing from you both is very much a thin high wire with which you must balance yourselves every single day. Um, one question I have for you is in terms of margins, would you say it actually supports your restaurant by buying local in terms of if it's in season? Absolutely. So that's something for all of us to keep in mind, I think, in terms of uh, sustainability of our restaurants. Thank you, guys. And it's also uh, the, quality, the quality of the food. If, if it's not in season and we still want to use it, then we have to keep in mind that we are now ordering it from a place that is not local mm -hmm. and they may be gassing it in a truck or, you know, bringing it from all the way across the country or Mexico. Uh, so and that does not a sustainable food system make, correct? Yeah. Thank you guys for what you're doing. I wholeheartedly support the mission and the vision behind the restaurant. So thank you on behalf of so many of us uh, who love your food and love your business model. So we're gonna start with another poll. What is the biggest barrier you face to purchasing local food? And you can select multiple answers.
Okay, let's see those responses should be popping up pretty soon. Wow, a whopping 53% say it's cost or finances. Interesting. 50% uh, uh, also said hours and timing of farmers markets or other locations. Then I'm seeing down below 39% uh, say a lack of information about local food options um, and close behind is distance to local markets. So it's interesting that one of the largest choices or the largest choice cost and finances, um, it sounds like there's a real cross the board presumption that buying local in season is expensive. That's interesting because what we are learning through this discussion series is actually quite the opposite. That if you buy local and you buy in season, it's actually very competitive, if not more affordable and more nutritious because we all know food is medicine, right guys? So Clara, I've got another question for you. Uh -huh. Tutti Fruity sells food both in Santa Barbara County and in other more distant markets. What are the barriers you and other farmers face to accessing local markets? Um, it's an interesting question because honestly, we fought really, really hard to get into those farther away markets. Um, so we, I feel like we started out fairly established within our community. Um, and as a small family farm, it is hard to get into those larger stores. And we altered a lot for us to do that. I personally do most of our local sales and our local nonprofit work. And so I love this question. <laughs> um, let's see. I think that the hardest part of doing local sales is accepting the fact that we can't guarantee the same um, consistency and timing and instantaneousness of ordering not from a small farm. We only harvest, for example, Tuesdays and Fridays. So you can't get my product on Monday or Sunday. Um, maybe I can find somewhere to source it. Once again, staffing is a problem. I only have an employee hired for two days of delivery a week. Um, and then seasonality and weather, we can't control yeah. all of those things. So I can't guarantee on the cauliflower that I sold today to the lark this morning, I couldn't actually guarantee that there wasn't going to be a heat wave and it was going to bloom and bolt and I wouldn't have a good product to sell them. And yeah. that's just the yeah. risk that chefs are running and ordering through us. Um, the flip side of that is that it's totally worth it. Uh, the freshness, <laughs> the nutrition, the flavor, um, knowing who it comes from. Barbarenio is one of the restaurants that, that recognizes that and it's an amazing thing. And chefs and farmers work so well together. I would really, really love to have all chefs <laughs> ask, just say, you know, Hey, it's, I understand as farmers, we understand it's a pain to can to switch, be like, Oh, we're going to use local Romas, but the season's only for three months. And then we have to switch back to getting them from Mexico. There's those two moments of switching that are time that are money that are consistency, but it's worth it. It's worth supporting your local community Agreed. and you fabulous relationships. Absolutely. Woo. So <laughs> I'm going to pivot now on, with that thread, Jack. I want to hear from you about your more diversified business model. So you have a few different products and services you share with the community. As we have learned, diversity plays a big role in the resilience of businesses. Could you talk about that? And what role does diversity play in your business? Hi, yeah. Um... So Kuyama lamb is almost uh, sort of on its primary end a service provider. 
for different landscapes. Um, we do a lot of um, fire fuel management. We do some ecological restoration work. We do some uh, rangeland management and pasture improvement. We do vegetation management in vineyards and orchards uh, or invasive species removal. All of those uh, important functions. Uh, we also sell live animals. We sell lamb meat. We do, uh, we, and we raise wool sheep. So we also have uh, a wool product that we sell. Um, we're starting to looking into doing uh, spinning yarn lines and doing other types of elements with the fiber um, and learning to do more uh, environmental mitigation, for instance, uh, using some of the publicly available funds to uh, do more uh, types of environmental mitigation, carbon sequestration and that kind of thing. Uh, what we really find from being that diversified, which you can tell is quite a lot of um, rings to have your hat in, is uh, that that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. And none of those are uh, very high margin uh, enterprises. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a, a lot of the you know, the idea is we can take uh, something that has a low margin and then stack another thing on top of that that also has a low margin and another thing on top of that that also has, and that all together, maybe we'll have, you know, enough margin to, to uh, have a resilient food system. Um, most of the time that is going to require uh, a charismatic young people who, you know, want to try and um, do everything all at once and, and be participating in so many of those things. And I think that it's, uh, I think we need to be asking ourselves, what is the problem that we're trying to solve with uh, asking farmers to be more diversified? asking them to also be able to purchase, distribute, and market a product or uh, hold all these other functions together without being uh, at a large enough scale where each one of those things can also appropriately carry itself. I mean, what we look at is we need to have an environmental mitigation entity which is large enough to be uh, profitable on its own and we need to have a uh, a lamb industry which is large enough to be profitable on its own and we need to have each one of these elements um, can help to stabilize each other if they are truly part of a, a, a plan to fix what is broken in our food system and part of a larger integration of how are we changing the way we think about land and thinking about the way that we access food and the relationship between us as consumers and producers to, to those much larger industries. I wanna stay on that thread, Jack. Jenna, can you speak then to what things are needed to be in place to support, support local farmers as they try to access local markets? So infrastructure, policies, can you briefly speak to that? Sure, and I'll try to keep it brief even though it's such a big, wonderful topic. Um, I'll say first starting on the side of if a producer is already up and running, and then I'm gonna backtrack a little bit. But um, for us, a producer already up and running, uh, like other folks have spoken to, there are these uh, needs for um, for processing, for storage, for distribution, and for like a marketplace storefront that all of us share. So we have this tendency to kind of over isolate and everybody needs to reinvent the wheel and solve these problems individually. Mm. That costs a lot of money, that costs a lot of time, um, 
And if we do it together, I think we would be much more successful in meeting our needs collectively. Um, so for example, there's so many of us who have to drive out of county to get our animals processed. So if we had one, a local, and I'm sure that with vegetables and other um, aspects, with olive oil, with wine, there's so many things that all have their unique processing facilities. Um, and if we could pool together um, to create processing facilities in our county that would serve an, so many producers. Um, also, there are ways that all of these things can become an additional cost, but they're also an opportunity. So that's why for us, looking at cooperative models of ownership, whether it's worker-owned cooperatives, producer-owned cooperatives, uh, or consumer-owned, or they could have multiple layers in one, that's really exciting. And I think that people want to feel ownership um, and have creative ownership um, and as a cons you know as both a producer and a consumer that's an exciting thing to be a part of and to take an active role in um, so that's processing storage as well cold storage is an enormous need and is something that would be totally affordable if we got together and did it and had the right uh, central location uh, where we could also distribute out of so like I think an integrated uh, hub or center that had processing facilities that had cold storage freezer space and refrigeration and had a beautiful um, marketplace mm -hmm. out front that we could all have uh, ownership in and be a part of and consumers could have ownership in um, and also I saw in that last question you know 50% of people found that farmer's market hours were restrictive or getting there on time. I certainly find that. Yeah. And it's another example where producers need to reinvent the wheel. Everyone needs to pay for labor, for fuel, for their own distribution. If we do these things together, we could probably spend the same amount of money, but have something open seven days a week um, and have more income because we're having more customers. I love um, it. There's too much to say in the short period of time. But I'm going to add just one little piece, um, which is um, really the infrastructure of helping new and young farmers get access to land and leases, uh, some kind of more open, transparent marketplace for that, and incentive and encouragement for landowners to lease land for farmers, because like Clara said, it's not an option to own in this area. And for a lot of people, it's not an option even to lease. Um, and secondly, is to address the how to the uh, having farm employees, we need housing. Yes. Because if that's unaffordable, then no one can work on the farm. So these are all uh, layered issues and can really only be addressed on a you know collective level. Not each farmer can problem solve each Got of it. these. Danny, I think you absolutely summed up a fantastic infrastructure system that can be county wide from consumer, uh, sorry, from producer to consumer and everyone in between. Thank you for that. So I'm going to pivot a little bit. Since COVID-19, we all know that it's impacted all of our lives in some way, shape or form definitely around food. A lot of us like me are cooking more. A lot of people are eating out more. A lot of people are getting food delivered. Uh, and I'm finding that even though it's in the beginning, it seemed a little sparse. Increasingly, every time I go to the farmer's market, it's getting busier and busier and busier. And I think it has something to do with it being safer to shop local farmers markets because it's outdoors in the midst of a pandemic. Oscar, on that subject of local support, how communities can get involved uh, in moving forward with food systems, at our last webinar, we talked about the importance of seed and keeping seeds in the community. What are models for seed saving? And where can people get access to those seeds? So um, 
We have a, a an attendee, uh, Margie, and I don't know if Wes Rowe is also attending, and she's been sharing information. There's uh, the Permaculture Guild of Santa Barbara has had a seed swap every year. And of course, uh, well, last year, what happened was last year, they weren't able to have it because they were so successful. They uh, got in trouble with the people that were lending them the space because the neighborhood was impacted by the amount of people interested in seeds. So they're going to do something online, I believe. Margie's saying she's been sharing this information and I've asked her to share it with everybody. Um, so there is a seed swap. You know, I encourage all of you that are uh, attending here today to um, take advantage of, of many of people said the, the where we live, but also, you know, in, in, this, um, in this craziness, there is much uh, opportunity for empowerment and none greater than growing your own food. And, the, and uh, this is another aspect of the, of the food chain, the food system in compl complementing everything that everybody else is saying, but it's from the consumer end where the consumer is the producer, but also we need to uh, um, remember that this is how we as America became great is that we grew food uh, as a community, as individuals. And I mean, in the fifties, it was a, maybe 50% rural uh, society. People were growing their own food and saving seeds, which is a natural part of it. There's nothing more, and that is where the pedal meets the metal. You know, these farmers couldn't grow a, a, a thing if they didn't have access to that seed stock. So th this is true democracy. This is true equality. This is true, you know, if, you know, justice, having access to that seed. So I encourage all of you to, uh, and so there's a seed, uh, you know, rather uh, the seed permaculture seed, uh, Guild and I, as a professor at City College, am committed to um, in, uh, educating the community and individuals around this process of growing food at home. But also, once you become empowered to do it, then you understand what the the restaurants and these other mm. uh, outlets are doing, and you become aware and involved and and act towards. You know, sometimes we need to get that pump primed. So maybe we can do mm. that at home you know, at our own doorstep, at our own feet, we can start growing food and saving seeds and then become inspired and appreciate, you know, the work that my comrades here on this uh, panel are doing. I love you, Oscar. Is that inappropriate? I love what you're doing. On a more personal level, can you tell us, because this is somebody who has tried, I've got still tomatoes in the back but at the same time they're they're living they're dying i mean yeah it's it's a sad situation back there what is the easiest thing that people can grow in their own gardens before i answer that question i want to invite you to take the green garden program with yes. me in the, and it's free i'll do it i'll do and it as an advanced class because I'll, I'll tell every, I'll, you'll learn everything you need to know but let me just say that and even if you live in an apartment and you have just a balcony or you know some concrete space that you couldn't imagine growing anything, and you you can in a container, uh, and take advantage of this this wonderful weather, but in a in a container in a contained situation, and we you know in in my class you'll learn how to you know to uh, observe for growth potential in your own home because everybody can do it. And leafy greens are the, the ultimate thing and, and probably the most uh, nutritious thing uh, that we can be growing and the quickest thing, you know, and as a matter of fact, weeds, dandelions are some of the most nutritious. If you're talking about survival, you know, like a prepper or something, survival, nutrition, right? You know, we got, we got an abundance, you know, but anyways, yes. So yes I greens. giggled. I'm so sorry, Oscar, to interrupt you. No worries. When living in China, I, what I, a number of years ago, I would get very confused by all the grandmas picking all the dandelion greens. I didn't understand. I thought they were just really concerned about weed pulling. And then I, these amazing flavors would come out of their windows in the kitchens. And so then they would feed us and we would try it. It was incredible. So I encourage people to not be afraid of the things Oscar's talking about. There's incredible nutrition and, and flavor in that. Um, on the subject of flavor, Julian, um, I'd like to go back a second to what we're talking about with the, the eating and the local purchasing side. 
So you probably interface with a lot of customers and other businesses that say, look, it's just too expensive to purchase locally. Okay, we saw that in the poll earlier. What do you say to that? And what are the other factors that might make up for the expense? Um, yes, yeah, so in our experience, that's, um, I mean, kind of starting out one caveat, I would say, was um, we built the restaurant with that as a uh, sort of a guiding principle that we would be getting food locally. So we, we built a scenario where we could change the menu and eat like that afternoon for that evening. Um, and we have a lot of flexibility and um, we kind of built our brand around that flexibility. Um, but um, in terms of being too expensive, Yeah, so certain things you just have to have to accept from a restaurant side. Um, so we run out of certain things every night um, in the restaurant industry called eighty sing. Um, but that we've had to have to learn how to like phrase that to customers in a uh, sort of way that they'll understand. Um, and then, yeah, like trusting the cooks to season to taste rather than have a cookie cookie cutter recipe. Um, because all throughout the produce, the produce is going to taste different depending on the season. So a lot of go, goes into training to allow you to purchase from the local farms. Um, but kind of with those assumptions met, um, we've found that it's significantly cheaper to purchase uh, from the local farms. Um, our food costs at the restaurant ranges from 25 to 26 percent. Um, of the food revenue and um, industry average is more like 28 to 33 percent. So we're actually below industry average. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the relationship Preston has built with the farmers. Um, as he keeps going to the same farmers over and over, they kind of trust him and value his long term business. So they, he gets better and better pricing. Um, and so, and uh, there's other intangible, uh, intangible benefits cost-wise. Um, having Preston go to the farmer's market is also, you could call it marketing expense, uh, but ha him having a conversation with a customer, a potential customer at the market is way more effective advertising than posting something in the independent. Um, so if you look at it from a, just a very rigid frame, it might be more expensive to use local farms, but when you kind of take the intangibles um, into account, it's way cheaper, or we're not cheaper, but uh, holistically more cost-effective to purchase locally. Um, and not to mention, um, if there are things that, uh, being a restaurant, we can get for a cheaper price that say a local um, chocolatier, like Mike Orlando at 24 Blackbirds, if he wants uh, to get cream and we can make a trade kind of a deal where I can purchase um, what he needs and then he can return and, and chocolate and things like that. Um, so I'm finding that the more and more I build these relationships with the farmers, um, it's not always a cash kind of trade off. So um, whether it's word of mouth around town that we're just together, um, trying to promote each other or trading products or business even. Um, it, it doesn't need to be more expensive than purchasing through a vendor, but I think oftentimes it may be easier to do it that way. So it's just really taking, taking the time and the pride in what you're doing and where you're living to make it worth it. What I'm hearing from you is a relocalization of the food system. And what I'm also hearing is the more localized it gets, the more affordable it gets. Mm -hmm. And then there's this multiplier effect of community building. That is incredible. I think that I'll speak for myself at this moment, but I humbly suggest we take for granted what's happening behind the scenes with the relationships 
and the sharing. I loved also what you talked about with Preston with the essentially the bartering, the way things used to be. I love it. Steve, I'm going to pivot to you now on the same thread. So you've spent a lot of time planning for the future of agriculture in this county. What do you think is the future of agriculture and farming in this county? And what will it look like if nothing changes? But what will it look like if we take the necessary next steps? Big question, <laughs> big question. Um, and it builds off of a lot of the things every, every one of our, our panelists have mentioned from you know, reconnecting people who grow the food with the people who eat the food with mm -hmm. uh, creating hubs that allow small farmers to aggregate their produce and meet the needs of a restaurant, for example, you know, because a single small grower can't do that on a regular consistent basis, but a network of them can. These are things that we've been talking about. And I think Oscar, the hub, the idea of hubs is, you know, a food hub, a, a centralized place where food comes in and then moves out and, and producers are part of it. Consumers are part of it. And the, and the county plays an important role in making such a space available uh, and promoting it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, if we don't change anything, it's going to keep changing. I grew up in Santa Barbara and I remember how diverse our agriculture was 50, 60 years ago or mm -hmm. more and how much we've lost to development, quote unquote, <laughs> and how much of that was incredible farmland that now can only be farmed, if at all, in people's backyards, which is good, which is but very how it used to be. And are we gonna continue to let that happen or, or is our county land use policy gonna shift in a way that protects and promotes ag land mm -hmm. and makes it available, especially uh, close to cities where you know, growth is always taking place. Um, and and we, we think about <clears throat> what is the model of a, of a sustainable food system that's people-based, that's relationship-based, that mm -hmm. integrates those three elements of sustainability we talked about right at the beginning, ecological, economic, and social. You know? a, a, a place where people matter. And for me, it's always been thinking about getting culture back into agriculture. Mm. not just a business. Mm -hmm. It's a way of life. It's a livelihood. It's integrating, protecting the environment along with protecting our local communities and making food available to them. So integrating all these elements that we've been talking about, you know, putting them into a way that people who are growing the food are supported by the people who consume the food. Uh, and, it's, and, and, and it just seems logical, you know, that if those two people are connected, yes. all that's going on in between <laughs> is removed. And, mm -hmm. and it's a direct relationship that reduces costs, reduces the carbon footprint, you know, creates local jobs, makes it so that, you know, the food system is a, is a people-based system. Mm. Wow, thank you. Robbie, did you have anything to add? Um, it just would be really along the same lines. I think um, I heard Oscar mention before action. I mean, it, it isn't just going to happen. It's not going to evolve to it. It's not all of a sudden magically going to happen. Probably, I, I imagine most of the people that are, are listening to this webinar now are proactive about local foods. But the question is, how do we really become activists about it? How does the county get behind it? How do um, innovative investors get behind it and look at what do we need to both support local small farmers that are really growing for, for, the, for the county and also consumers, all consumers, all, everyone needs to eat. So how does everyone in Santa Barbara County have access to good healthy food that's grown locally? Got it. So I'd like to sort of, um... I'd say popcorn, but I'm actually going to call you out as I see you on the screen. I've got a question for all of you to answer. Um, if you could just briefly jump in and then I'm going to start checking the Q&A. Oscar, I'm going to start with you. I know you're on your way out momentarily. How can our community 
countywide within Santa Barbara as it pertains to, for example, Santa Barbara City College, how can community members support your work? My work specifically to come to the classes. <laughs> and uh, my work is community work. And, uh, you know, at this point in my life, uh, I'm dedicating myself to sharing um, the 40 years of my experiences with my students. We have generations, you know, it's been mentioned a few times, we need the next generation to step up. Mm -hmm. If I can help be a conduit to that for these, all these fine people on this panelist, that would be wonderful. And so, you know, uh, support me by uh, not letting me sit in a room by myself talking to myself. <laughs> I wanna <laughs> share what I know, but I want people to experience, I call my classes experiences. You know, we need to get active. And sometimes it's not just a, a you know, uh, uh, trying to work our way through the conundrum of thought. It's just putting one foot in front of the other and 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 getting to going. So, you know, if if we can do that, um, um, you know, the, you know, the political will, all that other stuff. Those are other questions that I don't think I I'm able to answer. <clears throat> but what's clear is that this collectiveness, this collective uh, energy, um, we need to keep moving together towards each other. You know, uh, um, unfortunately, COVID has, you know, preached this together apart thing, but we really need to come together as soon as we can. We're organic things, plants are organic things. You know, we need organic, we are organic, we need each other. So, you know, it's really a, a two-way street, right? This support thing. Absolutely, thank you for that. You're welcome. <laughs> Switch over to Julian and Preston for a second. I would like to echo that question with a follow-up. Um, of course, I think we all know one of the great ways that we can support uh, restaurants like Babareño is to actually patronize them and, and frequently as community, as a family. Would you tell me two things? Are there other things that maybe we don't know about as community members that we can help the restaurant industry that are that are embarking on a business plan such as yours and can you share other restaurants around the county that are doing a similar business model than yours to yours mm. <clears throat> uh, i mean i think a way other than coming and dining with us um that would support would be supporting the market and and being involved in the community. Um, last year, there was uh, um, a protest outside of City Hall, a friendly protest about the location of Farmer's Market, which would affect not only restaurants, but the people in the area, but most importantly, the farmers, uh, that being their major source of income. And there was a handful of uh, restaurants there um, with us and a lot of the community, but um, being there to support the decision of the city um, to, to keep the market where it is in the center of downtown Santa Barbara instead of trying to move it um, or similar situations like that um, would definitely help yeah. restaurants that are supporting the farmers. Yeah. Access to your supply chain. Right. Yeah. To kind of go on that. Um, so the more everyone knows and values uh, eating locally benefits us as an offshoot because then the product we offer it has more value and people appreciate it more. So it's sort of a full circle thing where the more everyone else learns because I think we're doing things right, um, we sort of benefit from that along with, um, as you asked other restaurants, there's a lot in town um, and in the San Ynez Valley, they're doing a great job. Um, SY Kitchen, Bowl Life Flatbread. Uh, in town, I know Justin West, he does a great job. Uh, uh, Black Sheep. How about Sheep. North, North County? I think you said Black Sheep. What about North County? Are you aware? Um, let's see. I'm putting I'm not, you on the spot. That's I, went, I, want to, I want to add a plug in there for the Kriyama buckhorn, which is there you go. I Make was waiting it. for it. I was hoping somebody would bring up the buckhorn. In Northeast oh. County, in the Kriyama Valley, they're doing an amazing job connecting local food, um, farm to table restaurant. Absolutely. Worth the trip out to Kriyama. Oh, it's gorgeous out there, guys. I'm telling you, it is amazing. 
Sorry, and, and just for our viewers, um, the sun is clearly going down because I'm turning into a ghost. It's, it is what it is. I'm gonna take a look at our Q&A. Uh, we've got a question here. Let's see, what are the most common misconceptions people have about farming and agriculture, especially along the Central Coast? Ah, I would love for Jack and Jenya to answer that question. Again, on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, what are the common misconceptions? Um, I think one common misconception is that the best way to reach sustainability is to be small. Um, and I think that the need that we have is incredibly large for environmental stewardship and for, uh, for the production of healthy regenerative foods. Huh? So I think uh, we need to figure out how our food movement uh, scales to really meet the issues that we're facing and truly supports the land and the people at the scale that is required. Absolutely, it's excellent. Steve, could I get you to answer or speak to this as well? What are the most common misconceptions people have about farming and agriculture, especially along the Central Coast? I'm gonna flip back over to Jenny in a minute too. I wanna to hear what you have to say. Well, I think the biggest misconception is that uh, it's easy to be a farmer. Um, and that, you know, just by going to the supermarket and seeing this abundance of stuff that's there every day, all year long, you know, that it's nothing to worry about or to think about. And, and it's, um, it's also a misconception that, that, um, all that, you know, I think the biggest misconception is not understanding just how much food has to travel to get to the market. People don't know that. They just don't. And they don't really understand the impacts of the way conventional and industrial farming impacts the environment that they're on. Mm -hmm. Or they, they, they don't look behind the product to, to see who the farmers are or where, where the food's coming from. It's just, it's, it's like it's, uh, it appears on the shelf and, and that's, that's all they have to worry about. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, if only, guilty of that. And if only 5% of our food in the county, if people think only 5% is local, you know, do they know where the rest comes from? Mm. I don't think so. You know, and so it's, it's, a, it's a really big uh, challenge for us to um, spread the word about what local is, and, and then build a food system around that. I love it. So back to you, Jenya. Any misconceptions that uh, people may have, uh, especially sure, right now? Sure, I'll just chime in as a you know, producer of meat. Um, and as someone who myself had a long journey of taking on different um, dietary um, politics, so being vegetarian, being vegan, you know, or let's say only eating organic, thinking that there was just a certain set of rules as a consumer I could follow that would then mean that I was only buying, I was having a certain direct impact. And it just is not that way. Um, and no matter, you know, what labels we, we try to make to illustrate what is the impact of that food is having, um, it's, it, the label just doesn't demonstrate. It can, it can help, and I'm not saying don't use them, but when we see with our eyes the impact of some of the organic agriculture out in the Kuyama Valley, you know, we see that that label doesn't carry with it everything. And um, it can illustrate really good practices or it might not. Um, and so 
yeah, I think that that's a, a misconception. Sometimes we try and just uh, live by a certain set of rules and assume an impact, but when we're not seeing, uh, when we're not engaged with those, those farms or those producers, uh, then we're not seeing the impact and, and the story is usually more complex. Fair. Wow. That's a really, <laughs> that's really interesting what you have to say. Clara, I would love for you to jump in. Um, we're just about to wrap up and I'd like to get your take on that. Common misconceptions. Um, this might be coming slightly from a child's perspective. I work with kids a lot and talking about farming. Um, usually they're surprised that I'm female when I walk in. Common misconception, women can farm too. Um, but I always reiterate to the kids that farming is a community effort. Um, it's not one farmer with a tractor and a cow and a piece of straw in his mouth just growing some plants and magically put they arrive somewhere. Um, there are so many people involved in letting any ranch or farm run, um, whether it's someone in an office, whether it's a truck driver, whether it's the person arranging the shipping, whether it's the person who's on the forklift or the person who's breeding your seeds. Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many things that play into making that food and that food production. And getting that food on the table is already a huge community network and a huge community effort. Um, and I think people forget that. I love it. I love what you have to say about that. All right, so we're at about that time. We're gonna wrap up now. And in closing, I'd like to thank you all again for tuning in to our SBC Fan Discussion Series. A little emotional, it's the third and the last, and it absolutely was not least. Special thanks to our panelists who shared their time and expertise with us today. Thank you guys. And thank you to our funders, the Santa Barbara Foundation and the Orfala Foundation, and our sponsor for today, Impact Family Office, whose sponsorship allows for the Spanish interpretation um, and all of the additional support uh, and for a lot of uh, equity around panelists to be able to be here in the first place. So thank you so much to those folks. In a moment, this webinar will end and a pop-up will ask you to take a brief survey. Please take that survey. Please share your thoughts so we know what was valuable and how we can improve. Especially because later this month we'll be launching our member program. Woo! And so your survey responses will inform that as well as upcoming webinars. Look for a follow-up email in the next few days for a recording of this webinar and other resources. <sighs> Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Thank you again, guys. This was fantastic. We need more time. Thank you. <laughs>